already, you can share the link with your team. And following us on social media, you can take a look at what we are planning to. A uh, first announcement that I want to make, as I've been doing this entire month of January, is that Congenital Heart Academy is an official educational partner of the World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology and Pediatric Surgery and Cardiac Surgery. So please save the date. It's going to be in 2023, August and September uh, in Washington, D.C., we are very happy that uh, Dr. Gilvernovsky is one of the co-chairs and the team is preparing an amazing meeting to all of us and it's more than time for us to meet live together, in person together, so it's going to be amazing. And soon we are going to announce what the educational activities we are, we are going to be doing during this year in preparation to the World Congress. So keep an eye on our social media and we are going to know about everything. On Thursday, we are going to have another uh, episode of our fetal cardiology series. It's going to be a very nice meeting. So please, if you're interested in, in fetal cardiology, please join us this Thursday. And then uh, in February, Dr. Silverman is restarting his series. Uh, this is a very nice series because he makes the correlation between the echocardiographic images and the morphological uh, uh, pieces. So it's a very nice session and he's going to talk about the functionally single ventricle uh, this next uh, uh, this uh, all the three uh, all the four uh, uh, sessions is going to be about single ventricles and he's going to to start uh, this february the first so please uh, join us dr anderson is making uh, his uh, series in a very nice way correlating with uh, uh, 3D uh, images from CT scan that Dr. Justin uh, is making. So it's been very, very nice this, the way we are approaching on this uh, uh, series. The next two meetings are going to be about the sequential segmental analysis of the heart. So please join us. The first one uh, is going to be on February the 4th. Take a look on YouTube because the previous sessions were amazing. And we are happy, uh, very happy to support some activities from our partners. We are going to have this Saturday a very interesting uh, webinar uh, from the Congenital Cardiac Anesthesia Society, Society about uh, heart failure. So please join us. Uh, we have today one of the uh, panelists to discuss uh, in our journal club today is Dr. Luciana. And uh, she is one of the organizers, uh, organizers of the Da Silva Center for Absent Anomaly uh, Symposium. It's going to be on February uh, the 12th. It's going to be a Saturday as well. So please uh, uh, register and join. It's going to be the first one was amazing. I'm sure the second one is going to be great as well. And we are happy to announce that uh, also has now uh, a training program. Uh, it's online and it's very nice. So if you can, uh, if you are interested in uh, the basics of ECMO, it's a very nice course uh, to, to join. If you're a surgeon, this is a very nice hands-on training that has been held uh, once a month uh, with our colleagues from Sick Kids. Uh, Sasha is one of the proctors, so it, they send you 3D uh, print models, and then you can make uh, do the surgery uh, uh, actually. And the proctors are going to help you to have the best results. It's a very nice uh, training uh, activity. And now, with you, we are going to start our journal club of this month. Thank you guys. And please type all of your questions on the Q&A uh, chat box. We have amazing panelists with us today. So I'm sure there's going to be a very rich uh, learning experience. And if you participate, it's going to be even better. Gabriela. I think Sharmi wants to say a few words about the, the journal club, uh, Sharmi. Uh, no, it's fine. I think we'll just start since you've introduced her already. So Gabriela, please go ahead. We'll start with this. Okay. Amazing paper. It's a new, nice paper that we've read. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to be here with you to discuss this uh, very interesting topic. So first of all, thanks to Sasha, Gil and Grace and the Congenital Heart Academy for the opportunity to speak during this session. And thanks to my chief, uh, Dr. Jérôme Soquet, to let me present our experience. I try. I will try to share my screen. Just see if it's working. So I hope you can all see my screen, my full screen. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. So today I'm going to present our experience about the pulmonary valve replacement and redo pulmonary valve replacement, uh, replacement via minister anatomy. We have uh, no disclosure to declare to present this paper. 
And so let's start. As uh, we all know, pulmonary valve replacement is a common surgical procedure in adults with uh, congenital heart diseases, especially those involving the right side of the heart and requiring correction during the childhood. As we know, uh, a large part of this population is composed of the of patients with a tetralogy of fallow, which are corrected uh, during their infancy and then come back to us with a long-standing free pulmonary valve regurgitation and so an indication to replace their pulmonary valve. So let's uh, further move on our technique. We usually uh, perform an L-shaped uh, uh, mini sternotomy to approach the pulmonary valve and to make this procedure as safe as possible, uh, we deem to be uh, really um, uh, we, we deem to be really important to have a preoperative uh, uh, evaluation of the patient, which is usually made with a preoperative CT scan, which is integrated with a three-dimensional reconstruction of the <clears throat> pulmonary of the of the sternum and of the CT scan, which allows to us to find the appropriate uh, intercostal space to perform the lateral extension of the mini sternotomy. Usually this uh, intercostal space is the one facing the infundibulum of the pulmonary artery or the bottom of a previously inserted uh, transcendular patch. In case of reader procedure, you can see here a nice reconstruction, uh, 3D, a uh, nice 3D reconstruction of the CD scan. And we're going to further discuss this with a short video later. Then the procedure is performed under general, general anesthesia and non-motermic cardiopulmonary bypass. And the, usually because of the minimally invasive approach, we use to cannulate the right femoral vein, either percutaneously with the, or with a short cut down. As I said, the procedure uh, begins with the appropriate L-shaped uh, mini sternotomy skin in incision, which is carried down from the manubrium of the sternum uh, up to the uh, second uh, intercostal space uh, most frequently. A sternal retractor is then uh, placed and spread by five centimeters. Uh, we tried as much as possible to respect uh, during this uh, uh, cut down of the sternum, the left uh, internal thoracic artery. Then, as you can see here, the second crucial step of our procedure is to um, uh, careful, carefully and extensively dissect the thymus tissue and the anterior mediastinal fat tissue, which lies just in front of the great vessels, uh, uh, so the aorta and the, pulmonary, the main pulmonary artery, which needs to be nicely and extensively developed. Um, Aorta is then cannulated centrally because we, as I said, we developed uh, we developed nicely the great vessels. And another crucial element of this uh, uh, technique is the uh, transesophageal uh, echocardiogram monitoring, which is important not only when we wean the patient from cardiopulmonary bypass, but uh, uh, also before starting the procedures because it can detect an unrecognized shunt at atrial or particular level, which imposes to us to cross clamp the aorta to administer the cardioplegia solution and of course to uh, perform the left venting of the heart, which is done in this um, in this kind of operation through the ascending aorta proximal to the clamp. So then cardiopulmonary bypass is started after a bolus of heparin as usual. The section of adhesions, if needed, is extended to the infundibulum or infundibular patch in case of redo procedures, and also a uh, proximal part of the right and left pulmonary artery are nicely developed because, as you can nicely see in these images, if we need, we can perform without any problem also additional procedures on the pulmonary branches, such as an enlargement with a, peric a bovine pericardial patch. So then we perform an incision on the main pulmonary artery transversely at the level of the bifurcation and longitudinally toward the annulus or a previous uh, transcendular patch, except when we plan to uh, implant a stented, a stented pericardial bioprosthesis. In this case, in fact, we rather perform a transverse annular incision as you're going to see then in our video. 
uh, from this moment on, what we have to do is to resect the pulmonary cusps as well as any previously inserted patch or material. And then pulmonary valve replacement is performed choosing in between different options uh, depending mostly on the age of patients. In fact, our policy is to offer cryopreserved the pulmonary homograph to uh, patients uh, uh, aged less than 40s, while for the aged population, we can choose between uh, uh, stentless porcine valves or as a freestyle or stented pericardial bioprosthesis. As I said before, pulmonary branches can easily be uh, patched through this approach without uh, um, any further problems. So here I present to you a short video which is about uh, one of the patients of uh, our series. It was uh, a 52 years old uh, patient who was uh, repaired at the age of seven for a tetralogy of follow without any transcendental patch. She was lost to follow up for 33 years. And then as, the, uh, as it was expected, uh, she came back to us and to our attention for a severe pulmonary regurgitation with dilation of the right cavities. So a very high indexed uh, and diastolic right ventricular volume and then enlarged pulmonary annulus. Here you can see the images I showed uh, before, so the nice 3D reconstruction of the CD scan. And uh, uh, for this patient, especially, it was uh, very useful to have the sternal wires from the previous procedure because we found that the uh, infundibulum of the main pulmonary artery lied just between the second and the third sternal wires, which nicely corresponded to the second and the third intercostal space so we could plan before the surgery our incision which was uh, uh, up to the second and third intercostal space and also considering the age of the patient we decided for this case to use a stented uh, bioprosthesis uh, to perform the replacement and of course, to put this kind of prosthesis, we performed, as you can nicely see in this drawing, a, a transverse annular incision. So you can see, as I said, the first step of the procedure, so the skin incision and the dissection of the appropriate uh, intercostal space. In this case, of course, we had to remove sternal wires for the, uh, from the previous surgery and a repeat sternotomy so was used. Uh, in this patient, uh, actually, it was expected that the reader sternotomy uh, would have been safe because, uh, again, the preoperative scan was very useful to see that great vessels were pretty far from the sternum, so we expected to have no problem during the cut down of the bone. So as you can see, the lateral extension of the sternotomy is made just above the cartilage of the first uh, intercostal space. Then we complete the sternotomy and the tissues are carefully freedom, freed from the adhesions. As you can see, it's very useful for the senior surgeon to stand on the left side of the patient while carrying on the dissection on the right side of the sternum, especially on the ascending aorta. Here, we gently spread the sternal retractor up to uh, five centimeters, and we nicely developed the great vessels, feeding them from the uh, thymus tissue and the anterior mediastinal tissue. Um, I just stop a moment because this is a very important, this is a very important step of our procedure and uh, it's um, useful to do this maneuver so to speed up really gently the sternal retractor if we have very deep uh, uh, great vessels and we have inflated lungs on the way. Here we just expose nicely and further dissect the main pulmonary artery and the aorta so that we can perform the cannulation of the vessels. As I said before, the aorta is cannulated centrally. Here you can see also the cannulation of the vein so that cardiopulmonary bypass can start. We further um, uh, developed the uh, main pulmonary artery and the branches uh, with empty art. And here you can see the transverse annular incision, because as I said, we plan to put a uh, stunted bioprosthesis. Here you can see the sizing. So uh, finally, we decided to put a 25 millimeter stunted bioprosthesis. And our technique is to put it in place with a running suture, which you can nicely see here in the video. 
and we, we incorporate the main pulmonary artery in the front part of the suture. This is going to be shown in a moment. So for this procedure, we had a rather short cardiopulmonary bypass time, about uh, 58 um, minutes. The result uh, on the final transesophageal echo was nice. And so we could uh, decannulate the patient, administer the protamine as usual, and complete the procedure in the standard fashion. Here you can see the valve in place and the main pulmonary artery closed. Here you can see that we put two uh, 10 French drains at the level of the third intercostal space. Then as usual in standard uh, uh, cardio, cardiac surgery procedure, we put the sternal wires and we close the sternal layers. And for this patient, the uh, final length of the incision was 8.3 centimeters. So uh, according to our experience, we can suggest some recommendations for all the surgeons who would like to approach uh, pulmonary valve uh, uh, via minimally invasive uh, techniques. First of all, uh, of course, it's intuitive that it's better to approach virgin chest patients before performing widow procedures. Second uh, element, we should be underlined, safe and appropriate exposure of the infundibulum is mandatory. So uh, it's really important to have a good preoperative CT scan and the nice treat during construction because it's uh, critical to have the good skin incision and the good uh, sternal incision to reach the great vessels. Then, as we stressed before, it's really important to uh, perform a systematic resection of the anterior mediastinal fat tissue because this is the only way to achieve a good exposure of the aorta and the main pulmonary artery. And as it was nicely shown in the video, it's recommended for the senior surgeon to stand on the left side of the patient while dissecting on the ascending aorta. So now I'm going to present you a brief review of our first year experience. So we operated eight consecutive patients with a median age of 31 years, uh, for starting from December 2019 to December 2020. Uh, of these cases, two were just isolated pulmonary valve replacements, so virgin chest procedures, while all the others were redo procedures of this. Uh, uh, lay of this uh, ladder, sorry. Uh, five were uh, tetralogy of follow patient who underwent repair during their childhood. One was a third sternotomy. It was in fact the patient who underwent uh, a ROS procedure during his infancy for a congenital aortic stenosis. He received during this procedure a pulmonary homograft, but then came back with a failing autograft. So he underwent a dental procedure and then he further came to our attention with a failing homograft. In all the patient of our series, the indication for surgery was pulmonary valve regurgitation. So in 100% of the cases, we performed a minimally invasive approach. So an L-shaped ministernotomy down to the second in the intercostal space. We had the median skin incision uh, length uh, of um, a median skin incision length, sorry, of uh, uh, 7.2 centimeters, while the median cardiopulmonary bypass time was 69 minutes. In four patients, we were, uh, we were, it was necessary to cross clamp the aorta because we detected the shunt mostly at the arterial level with a bubble contrast uh, transesophageal echocardiogram. Speaking about the results, they, looks, uh, they look very promising uh, up to now because we experienced no major cardiac injuries. Uh, no patient needed conversion to full sternotomy. We had no in-hospital mortality. No patient needed blood products. And we had a really uh, rather short median ICU stay, about uh, uh, 1.5 days. And so accordingly, a short median in hospital stay, about 6.5 days. And up to now, we have a, a follow-up of 12.8 uh, months. So which can be considered the advantages of this procedure according to our experience? 
Of course, these advantages are mostly evident when we perform reduced sternotomy because a minim minimally invasive approach avoids a challenging dissection on the right ventricle, which is typically dilated in this patient. So it can be very stuck to the inferior part of the sternum, which, are, which we are not going to develop in our approach and so can be easily injured. Uh, we also noticed a reduction of postoperative drainage time with a minimal risk of tamponade in radio cases because arterial and ventricular adhesions are respected as much as possible. Of course, as a consequence, we noticed a fast recovery of patients with a, a shorter ICU stage and uh, subsequently a fast home discharge. Also, we noticed uh, some advantages of the minister approach also when it's compared to um, its uh, direct competitor, which is the left anterior mini thoracotomy approach for minimally invasive procedures on pulmonary valve. In fact, this latter approach uh, doesn't uh, allow to have a safe access of the aorta. So uh, if we need to access the aorta, it's rather difficult with this cut. And also it's difficult to cross clamp the aorta if imposed by an intracardiac shunt. And, and another advantage that, is that uh, thanks to the minister, not we, we can reoperate the patient's car and we don't need to put to her to make another, to make another incision on the skin. Of course, as uh, all the minimally invasive uh, procedures, uh, uh, also our approach presents some limitation, and these are especially uh, evident when we have to perform other procedures requiring uh, extensive pericardial dissection, which can expect it to be in this kind of population tricuspid repair or implantation of uh, pacemaker lids and also patients with uh, dilated uh, ascending aorta, which can be in direct contact uh, with the sternum are not deemed uh, suitable for this procedure. And this can also be very typical for uh, patients with a tetralogy of follow, which represents the uh, larger part of our population. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gabriela. It was uh, 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 really good and uh... As a non-surgeon, I've learned a lot, and I think we have a lot of things to, to discuss today. And uh, I think we could uh, start the discussion. Of course, we don't have any questions from the audience so far. And um, we invited uh, Luciana Fonseca from Pittsburgh and uh, Rodrigo from uh, University of California because they both, I know that they have uh, personal experience with uh, minimal, minimal invasive uh, surgeons. So I'd like to listen their experience and what they think about this technique. And then, of course, uh, followed by Sasha, our always surgeon, and uh, uh, the other members of, of the panel. And uh, we have the senior author of the paper with us today. So it's going to be nice to listen to uh, his uh, uh, remarks on that, too. What do you think, Gil? That, that's the way to go? That sounds perfect. Thanks. OK, great. Luciano or Rodrigo, who wants to, to start? Luciano first. <laughs> I think you're muted, Luciana, please. Congratulations for the paper and for the presentation also, very good. And um, uh, I think this is a good approach, but of course it's not for uh, objective for aesthetic procedure. It's more for to avoid bleeding, major bleeding and the dissection of the, 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 the chest, unless the patient was not operated before, right? Um, so I, I, I really like minimally invasive approaches, and I just sent a link for a paper that we published in 2005 in Brazil regarding our approach to uh, bidirectional gland procedure after Norwood. And we did almost the same, but going to the, doing a, a L inverted towards the right side. And, and then we dissect uh, the aorta and the apex of the, the right atrium. And then we put the cannula. We didn't we use the groin in that situation. I saw you, you are using the, the groin. This is uh, good for adults, uh, mainly. And, uh, and then we were able to do gland procedure as a second stage for Norwood. And we start doing that 
in our uh, early experience with the gland in Norwood because we, we lost a patient with infection, side infection in the, in the sternum. And then we had another case that we had bleeding due to the dissection of the heart. And this complicated the operation and then the patient died due to multiple transfusions and things like that. So we, we started using that in Brazil and we had really uh, good uh, results with that. So I, I think this approach for to avoid dissection of the heart in reoperations, it's a, a, a good thing. And I, 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 I even like if you open the, all the, the, the bone, you don't need to dissect all the heart to do the replacement of the, the pulmonary valve. So this, I think this is the, the, the main goal of this operation is to, to avoid full dissection. And uh, even you can do with the heart beating as you show in the last, uh, last video to decrease the, the need of dissection of the, the, the aorta if you don't have any PFO or VSD that could bring air inside the blood of the patient. So um, I, I, I really like that. And if you, if you in the future, we, you plan to avoid cannulation of the groin, you can also make a T, inverted T, cutting to the right side also to dissect the tip of the right atrium where you can install a cannula to drain the heart. So I think this is my, my main um, my main comments on that. And congratulations again again for the, the great presentation. Thank you, and thank you for the nice suggestion to avoid the groin. I think it's important to consider it. Yeah. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to see you again, Grace. Thanks for the invitation, everyone. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations for the paper. I mean, it's amazing. I really think that um, minimal invasive techniques on cardiac surgery is the way to go. Um, I think that uh, it, it makes, we hear at UCSF, we used to say that uh, small incisions make a big difference, and it, and it does. Um, and it's not about just small incision, but it's about everything like uh, regarding the pre-op and post-op care of this patient. So it's really important to, to, to pay attention to these details, also not only the techniques of what is done. Uh, but uh, a few comments on on, uh, on our strategy on this. Um, I think um, the minister anatomy is a great approach, um, and it can and it can also be done through tracheotomy also. But um, I think that I think a little bit different from uh, what Luciana said uh, that uh, we usually prefer uh, cannulating everyone through the groin whenever possible uh, because a um, couple of things. Number one. Um, you have much more space to work, especially when you have to approach the aorta also. Uh, and number two, uh, especially in, in, in old patients, uh, even if they're corrected before for congenital uh, problems or not, uh, they uh, intend to have some uh, plaques uh, on this in aorta. So if you can avoid cannulation, it, it would be a good idea. Uh, and and it has we have a lot of data supporting that the, the peripheral cannulation does not enhance the chance of um, uh, stroke on 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 the setting of patients. So so we used to cannulate everyone use uh, that we do, do minimal invasive through the groins, but of course as I said whenever possible. And the other thing is that um, um, I think that uh, one issue that we need to think about is that how to de-air the the, the heart when you have to approach the aorta also because there's a communication between the right and left side. So it's it's a problem when we do the mini sternotomy. Um, uh, it's, it's, there's a way to do that. We do that using CO2 and then we avoid that. We flood the, blood, the, 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 the surgical field with CO2. Uh, actually we do that for every patient with, that we use minimal invasive. And um, I think it's an amazing, amazing strategy. Um, especially because uh, you avoid redissecting the heart. And this is, this is a real big problem on this patient, especially if they are frail at the, the moment of the definite correction. Um, well, that's, that's my two cents. I, I, th I think it's a great paper. Congratulate, uh, I congratulate you guys. Uh, I, I want to 
take another word. You said about the peripheral cannulation, but sometimes the patient doesn't have uh, veins anymore, especially like the fontans, late reoperations. If you don't have the, that vein there, you are done. So this is another way. Yeah. It's just, yeah. I, I just mentioned it. And for small uh, patients, I prefer to avoid the groin. Like we do yeah. uh, uh, axillar approach for ASD, VSDs, we never use the groin because we are operating small yeah. babies. So in this same situation, if you are thinking to like repair valves in, in small kids through that incision, you, you can use another approach. I just no, you're remember. absolutely correct. Absolutely correct, 100%. But uh, it's, that's why I said whenever possible. And yeah. uh, but one thing that is important that when you do use, and, and I, I, I say that because you do a lot of reduce here. So uh, when you cannulate through the groin, the, the, the good aspect of that, whenever possible, again, uh, is that you can do, the, for instance, the redo operation much more safely at the beginning with, because everything is decompressed. So even if the aorta is close to the sternum, it's possible to access everything because everything is decompressed, like we do when we do um, um, uh, standard sternotomy. So, if possible, groin cannulation, especially in reduced cases, would be would be uh, uh, a bailout plan to avoid any kind of uh, aortic injuries during the sternal open. Thank you. 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 Thank
axillary artery. You can do that without any problems. And it's going to be just a puncture site without any incision. Um, uh, but once again, I, I totally agree with Luciana. I think that you should have experience on what you're doing and uh, or have someone proctoring you or anyway, but uh, you should have someone really experienced with the method because uh, it's not worth it to risk uh, patient's safety because uh, you're trying to do some, like like she said, crazy innovation. Uh, but uh, this, this, this might be another uh, access point. Like it doesn't mean necessarily femoral needs to be just peripheral because the point is to have more space to work and to have everything decompressed when you open it sterner. Okay, great points. And uh, Gil, what do you have to, to tell us about it? What are uh, your, your ideas? I, uh, first of all, first of all, what a terrific presentation and experience and thanks for presenting that to all of us. Um, I, as I was making notes during the paper and uh, many of the things I wrote down have been brought up by Dr. D'Souza and Dr. De Silva already, but I wanted to sort of tie a little bit of this together from the perspective of a baby doctor, um, which is, you know, very, you know, when I look at the size of that patient, I'm like, oh my gosh, how, how are we going to take care of a patient like that? But I work at a place where many of the adult congenital patients come into a pediatric cardiac intensive care unit. So what I wanted to um, just mention and wonder and certainly get uh, your input, Gabrielle and, and Jerome, from, from your experience here is, um, you know, what's so important in, our, in all of our patients is to know the prior history in detail. It can't be the details are so important. And I'm looking at the age of your patients, realizing that the original operative notes are from last century. Um, and certainly now it may be very hard to find how that old procedure was done. Um, and you know, patients having 30 or 40 years of um, comorbidities that may affect your decision to do this with this excellent technique versus a more standard uh, approach. Um, I, as I was thinking back to the way we provided intensive care for many of the children back in the day when they would have had this Ross procedure, for example, as you described, or, or a tetralogy repair, groin access was the standard. So it's not uncommon for these kids, now adults, to have occluded femoral vessels. As was said before, they've had multiple procedures and whatnot, and, and not only from a surgeon's perspective, but also from a post-operative perspective, I think it's very important that these patients have a complete evaluation of all of their systemic veins. So you, you showed your CT, but it's important for us to know, is the IVC open? Is, are both femoral veins open? As was mentioned before, the axillaries and whatnot. Because it may not only be an issue in cannulation, but if there is a problem perioperatively, we need to know how to get in there fast. So that's an important part of the history of bringing that, um, of bringing that in. And then I had really, um, when people were talking about experience, it brought up one of my favorite quotes, which is, um, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. You know, and, and as Luciana said, you know, we had a, a, pa a patient who had a lot of bleeding and whatever, and that sort of takes you into the next step and how we get these great innovations that uh, Gabriella, you just presented. Um, the only specific question I had about it is I understand that it is helpful to make it safer in the OR. Is there any sense that you had either objectively or even uh, or subjectively about pain in redo mini sternotomies versus full sternotomies. You mentioned the length of stay, and again, I don't take care of many adults, so I'm trying to figure out, is there a, uh, a benefit in the perioperative period also? Thanks for letting me uh, just make a few comments. Yeah, thanks for your question, Gil. And actually our patient didn't experience more pain than usual. We saw that it was uh, mostly as uh, the, uh, as a standard procedure and actually sometimes it was also better because we could remove uh, a little bit uh, um, earlier the drains and as you know drains are really painful for patients so if you can remove them earlier of course it's better for the pain so actually we didn't we didn't uh, experience uh, any bad feeling for the patients uh, about pain you think it's better that there may be less pain well, of course, <laughs> I think it's better because uh, 
sometimes uh, patients who are, who suffer for pain takes uh, take a lot of medications and so they can experience also other complications for drugs or medication that we administer so I think if we uh, if we take this in the old uh, complex of the patient, it's definitely better. Uh, Gabriela, just one uh, uh, one quick question. I, sorry because I don't remember you saying that. Was were the patients extubated? Uh, the patients extubated uh, in the OR or in the or no, not in this series? No. Okay. Okay. And I, I agree with the the uh, pain question. I think it is le is less you have less pain because the, the chest is more stable. And then even when the, pa the patient's taking, taking deep breath, he will not feel the discomfort of the, the moving of the bone in the lower part. It's more, yes. There is more stability in the, in the sternum. Yes, they do have pain. Thanks. Thank they you. have an objectively assessed pain with questionnaires and uh, the general feeling of, of us from the surgical perspective and the post-operative perspective is that they, they, they have a nice experience uh, and they, the pain is uh, certainly at a lesser level than for a conventional full stenotomy. And what is also surprising uh, to talk about pain and scar and the small incision is um, from redo patients, um, so they already have a scar, uh, but when they find out after the operation that we have been able to do a mini sternotomy, uh, surprisingly, they, they are happy. Uh, well, you, you could think that they don't, <clears throat> they don't care about having another full sternotomy because the scar is already there, but they are actually nicely surprised um, somehow. And I was surprised by the reaction uh, to have a small scar and also to have not an additional scar or an extended scar. So that's the other nice feedback we had from them. That was surprising. Great, there are some questions from the audience. Uh, Gabriela kindly answer uh, already, but I think they're uh, good points that we can use for the uh, discussion. There's one question about uh, uh, the vascular complications in the groin uh, cannulation. I think uh, uh, Gabriel and Jerome could answer that and uh, uh, Rodrigo could add his experience with the vascular closure device because it's the next question if uh, the complications are, are uh, higher in the patients that uh, when it's used the vascular closure device. As a cat lab doctor, I would say it's very safe and uh, controls very well uh, the bleeding, but I've never, of course, uh, our equipment's a little bit smaller than what is used for, for a bypass. Gabriel, if you could uh, uh, start talking about the vascular complications. Sure. Actually, we didn't experience uh, vascular complication in this series, although it's a small number of patients, so this can be, of course, confounding. But actually, I think it's mostly because also we avoid, as Jerome uh, said before, cannulating the artery, which is the most uh, common source of complication. So we just cannulate the vein, and although also the vein can get to some complication, I think it's safer to just cannulate the vein and perform central cannulation of the aorta. So if Jerome wants to add something. Yeah, for, for the vein cannulation, we, we used to start with a cut down. And as the experience uh, went further, we stopped uh, doing cut downs and we just do uh, it percutaneously. Uh, we, we do cut downs though, uh, when we think there may be some risk, uh, of, uh, great vessels injuries, um, and that we need to go on bypass and via, uh, the femoral artery. In that case, we do cut down, but when from CT scan, we see that, uh, the aorta and the primary artery are very far from the sternum and we know it's going to be very safe. Uh, we just kind of like, um, the vein, uh, and uh, percutaneously, and then uh, the aorta centrally. Yeah. So um, about the the percutaneous techniques of um, controlling that, um, actually, I, I don't I don't see many complications on that. As as Grace said, I mean it's it's pretty pretty safe device. Uh, it's very I mean it's used a lot all around the world. So there's huge amount of experience of everyone about that. And um, generally, we can we can control. Uh, we put during the insertion of the arterial cannula, 
uh, we do put two per closes in and at the positions of um, two and 10 uh, hours. Uh, and um, one thing that we used to do is when we remove the arterial cannula at the, cannula at the end, we keep the guide wire in. So um, if needed, we can insert, we have a control environment. So we can, uh, if the bleeding didn't stop, then we can insert a third per close. And, and I mean, in our experience, 100% of the times, I mean, and I'm telling them more than 3,000 minimal invasive procedures, um, it is um, like most of the times the, the, the bleeding is controlled. And um, I know that by, um, by the book, everyone should have um, a controlled um, angiogram after percloses insertion, but we can do that control with the ultrasound also. And if there's good flow and no stenosis, uh, then we're fine. Yeah, that this would have been my question about stenosis after using this uh, system to percutaneously yeah, it, it, the it, it, because it can be a problem, I think, on small arteries. So this was my yeah. upcoming question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as 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 higher as you use your arterial cannula, the less chance you have of stenosis because, of course, you do have a, a larger vessel. And the important thing is to to um, make sure that the positioning of the perclosures are adequate because if you put them like one over another then you go biting the artery in the same position grace knows that because she's intervention interventionalist and does that all the time but um uh, you you're, you go biting the artery in the same place and then you and you create an indentation and this makes the stenosis uh, worse sure and uh, um I have one question for everybody. Do you think the minimally invasive is going to be the future, like uh, for everybody is going to be uh, the opposite, it's going to be the standard of care, and then uh, the big uh, uh, sternotomies are going to be the exception, or we're we never going to reach that, it's going to continue to be for us only selective cases? Well, I think as long as we continue showing favorable outcomes, for minimally invasive surgery, then people will move towards uh, uh, this approach. Um, but I, I don't think um, it is a, a goal, uh, although uh, I think a minimally invasive approach is, uh, is a tool. Uh, I was uh, reviewing the, uh, recently, the, I was reading about the, the recent consensus document on ERAS, you know, this uh, enhanced uh, recovery after surgery that was uh, published by the um, American Association of Thoracic Surgery, because I had to do a presentation in my center about this paper. And uh, I was surprised to, uh, to see that there was no mention at all uh, about minimally invasive approach. You know, um, you know early extubation, for example, is not a, a goal. It's a tool for enhanced recovery of patients. Um, and I think a minimi, minimally invasive approach is also part of a you know, um, as a, is a component of um, this global strategy. Uh, and so hopefully, yes, um, uh, these kind of techniques will spread. Well, thanks to this kind of webinar too. Uh, so I, I think we will we'll move on towards. Uh... In, in my, my opinion, I, I don't think a minimally invasive approach will be the uh, only option in the future. I think uh, the first thing we need to think we have a different experience all around the world and uh, the surgeon experience raise until a point and then the patient, the, the surgeon retire and then come the new generations. And the new generation needs to be trained again and retrained. And the main goal of the procedure needs to be the result. The result in the, inside the heart, not outside of the chest. And then you need first to have a great experience doing uh, normal incisions. But if you, need, if you want to transition to small incisions, we need to keep in mind, you must keep the same results not only the immediate result. We need to keep like doing the repairs as we would do in 
big incisions. And the, the repair need to last longer as in the normal incision. So if you are thinking to do minimally invasive just to be less invasive, uh, to think in the immediate result, you are wrong. It's not the case of people here in this, in this table. I'm just telling for uh, everybody uh, else. Uh, the main goal of the procedure needs to be the long term. And this means for the heart and for the vessels also. This is the, the reason I, I keep saying that I prefer, in my experience, do cannulation through the chest, unless we need to go through the groin. But keeping the same result with the small incision. So I, I think, and like I said before, people need to be trained and we need to train new generations. And this is the reason I think we should have like movies and movies to keep uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a system that later on people can take a look and see what I can do. If the people like Dr. Roger Mee in, 19, in the 90s, he was having great results in transposition of great arteries or at almost zero mortality. And we need to train people to do to have that same result. It depends on the, the size of the incision. Thank you. If I just uh, make a comment as a young surgeon, I think uh, our advantage is that we, of course, can take a look to the future with this uh, new procedure, minimally invasive approach. But I think we are lucky if we can also we, if we can also take an high to the past because I think it's uh, useful to know all the kind of techniques we can use to be prepared for complications independently of our approach. And of course, I think if we know all the techniques that are available, we can choose the best technique for each patient and of course, uh, reach the best results and the best, safe, best uh, patient safety. So I think this is my opinion as a young surgeon. No, I, I, I totally agree, Gabriela. I think that um, uh, it's really, really important to a modern cardiac surgeon to have all their momentarium uh, available. And uh, I wouldn't say that mainly invasive surgery is for everyone, for every patient, but I can tell you two couple of things. Number one, most of the patients are demanding that. They're coming to us and say, well, I don't want that uh, my chest cracked. And um, this is a problem, this is a problem. I know we face uh, severe diseases, but this is something that we should uh, learn um, ways to, to, to go around. And, and of course, uh, using the, guide, the guideline as safety first, but we need to have uh, solutions for that. I mean, and um, the other thing is that uh, in our program, for instance, we always think about doing something minimally invasive first. Uh, and there's some patients that are not indicated to do that, or they have contraindications to do that. And then we go for um, um, uh, standard techniques. So it's really important for the modern cardiac surgeon today to have uh, all the, the percutaneous approach, the minimally invasive approach, the open open chest approach. And we, we should offer that all this, um, this um, menu, as I can say that, uh, to the patient uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, selecting which one is the best for the patient. So I, I don't think it's a rule that's going to be to everyone, but it should be offered to everyone that is, um, is a candidate to. And we should tailor that because of the patient, not because of the surgeon. Sorry, wait. Um, not always. Sometimes you need to say to the patient that it's not possible, right? You, uh, first, you need to keep your result, and th this means to keep the, the result for the patient also, the long-term result. So, like, if it's possible to do uh, a small incision, great. We should offer that. You should not offer dreams if you, you, if you are not able to do that. Like, if a patient come to me here with a huge 
Epstein's anomaly type C, very displaced, I would not offer uh, axillary approach for that patient, even if the patient doesn't want to have the, the, the heart crack. Special situations, special techniques, counting with the armamentari. This is my opinion. True. Jerome, do you want to make uh, uh, more comments about uh, the, the paper itself? Yes, so, so, um, so uh, first, thank you for the opportunity to present this, uh, for this, uh, this paper. Um, my, my first comment is um, about the fact that it's not all about surgery, uh, because uh, I think it is not possible if the whole team is not involved. Uh, if the surgeon decides uh, on his own, he's doing minimally invasive surgery. Uh, but if there's no fast track, if, uh, uh, for example, th there's, there's no point. Um, I think it has to be a multidisciplinary work. Uh, so I'm curious about uh, uh, your insight and also the, the, the audience insight, uh, especially the intensivist. Uh, because, um, for example, do you, if you see a patient coming with a small incision, do you act differently? Uh, do you extubate them earlier? Um, is there any different pain management? Uh, so you, you understand that um, this is a global approach. Um, we have a, a very nice um, adult uh, cardiac intensivist here, Neil. Um, and these patients, even if it's a third, fourth stenotomy, mini stenotomy, uh, in complex patients, they are willing to extubate uh, in the first hours uh, after surgery because they see that the patients are stable. Uh, but if you're facing intensivists who are a bit more uh, or more conservative or scared, or like, you may not obtain the same results. So it has to be a teamwork. Um, and same in the world. Uh, the cardiologists also um, need to understand that, yes, it's a complex surgery, but it's uh, less invasive procedures. And, uh, so, and the goal is to have enhanced recovery. So there's no point in keeping the patients um, in hospital for nothing. Um, so this is my first thought. And that's why I, I, wanted, I really wanted to have uh, among the co-authors uh, people from different specialties, like find radiologists, intensivists, um, and cardiologists, and not just uh, surgeons. Uh, the second comment is, um, is the difference between adult and pediatric and congenital heart surgeons. I think um, we have a lot to learn from adult surgeons. Uh, <clears throat> I think they're more advanced than congenital surgeons uh, when it comes to minimally invasive approaches. They have robotic um, mm -hmm. surgeries, they have mid-cap, VATS. Um, and I feel like, maybe it's a wrong impression, but I feel like uh, congenital surgeons are more conservative in general. And we just go for sternotomy without asking too many questions. <clears throat> so I think we have to learn from them. <clears throat> and that uh, you, a congenital heart surgeon cannot start uh, uh, a minimally invasive program on his own. So he, it has to, uh, he or she has to train um, in adult surgery first. And that's the first principle. Um, and yeah, so I think nothing, well, it's like medicine in general, nothing is possible without a, a teamwork. Amazing. It was, uh, first of all, congratulations for your work that it was reflected in a very nice paper. And, uh, and this uh, journal club uh, was very, very nice. And it was a, a very interesting idea uh, to bring a surgical uh, paper. That's something that we don't discuss too much. And uh, it was amazing. Uh, I don't know if uh, anyone else has a final comment, but, but this has been a, a very nice session. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I just uh, want to thank everybody. And we, we have uh, different opinions. Doesn't mean that one is right or the other is wrong. It's just uh, like, our experience and that's it yeah that's and that's that's, that's the amazing thing yeah <laughs> to just raise the ideas and debate and then that that's how science moves forward and this exactly. is this is really great this is really great mm -hmm. yeah, yeah i'd like to thank everyone again and and say congratulations to the authors of the paper amazing job thank you
right. Okay, guys. So see you much. in uh, one month. And they're going to have uh, another uh, um, journal club. We are going to let you know soon what's going to be the paper that we're going to discuss. And uh, again, if you want to present uh, your uh, your manuscript, if you want to, to present uh, your work to in this journal club, please send an email to us and we'll be happy uh, to organize uh, that. Thank you very much uh, uh, to everybody. Thank you. Thank you.